Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. We're all enjoying another colorful Vermont fall with our landscape awash with an array of reds, oranges, and yellows. Behind the beauty are questions about why do the leaves change color and why do the colors and intensity vary from year to year. One of the top maple tree and foliage experts in the country works at Proctor Maple Research Center in Underhill, where she spoke with Across the Fences, Rebecca Gollan. My name is Dr. Abby Vandenberg. I am a research assistant professor here at the University of Vermont Proctor Maple Research Center. What I do here is research on all aspects of maple trees and maple syrup production. I specialize in the physiology of maple trees and also in the chemistry and the composition and flavor of maple syrup and particularly how processing impacts those variables. Tell us a little bit about your work in the past studying foliage. When I was an undergraduate forest biology major here at the School of Natural Resources at UVM, um, I wanted to do a senior research project, an, an honors thesis, and I was working with a faculty member named Doc Donnelly, who many people know, um, and he really wanted me to do a study looking at the physiology of fall color, in, in, in particular in maple trees, um, since it was such an important economic driver for the state. And so, this basically this journey began uh, this very long journey later uh, began as a senior thesis project at the university of vermont and i was looking for a field site site to do some of my research as an undergraduate and i was turned on to some ongoing phenology plots here at the proctor maple research center and you know one thing led to another and i ended up using the proctor center as my field site to study the um, physiological factors underlying fall color in sugar maple as a, and that was my senior project and that was my first introduction to the Proctor Center. So um, following that I ended up doing a master's thesis on the factors that control the expression of color in sugar maple. Then I also did, uh, I followed that up with a doctoral dissertation research on the physiology of the anthocyanin pigments, the pigments that are responsible for the red colors in leaves. So it all started as a senior project that not only got me into looking at fall color and, and the physiology of fall color, but also introduced me to the Proctor Center. Um, and I managed to end up back here as a technician and then doing my dissertation research while I worked here. Tell me a little bit about the science that makes fall foliage happen. Well, it's really um, something that we know lots about and a little about all at the same time. So there are two processes that go on as leaves change color in the fall, and they go on sort of simultaneously. The first is the loss of chlorophyll. So as a response to the signal of shortening day lengths and also it's kind of modulated by temperatures and some other weather conditions but mostly it's in response to um, the cue of shortening photoperiods or day length the chlorophyll in the leaf begins first the leaf stops making new chlorophyll and then at the same time the leaf is also breaking down the chlorophyll that's there so that's what we begin to see, the reduction in green. And as that chlorophyll begins to get broken down by the leaf, there are pigments that are present in the leaf all the time. Uh, predominantly, they're yellow in color. They're accessory pigments called carotenoids. And even though they're there in the leaf all the time, um, they are masked because chlorophyll has a, so much higher absorption than the carotenoids. So as that chlorophyll begins to break down, the yellow pigments that are there all along get revealed. So in a lot of species of trees, like some of the ones behind me here, that's really the only process that goes on when it comes to fall color. The breakdown and removal of the green and the exposure of the yellow and sometimes the orange that's already there. So that's step one. And then in a lot of other species, there's a secondary process that is interrelated but also having nothing to do with the loss of chlorophyll and that is that these leaves are producing anthocyanin pigments during that fall leaf senescence process. So in these leaves, these anthocyanin pigments, which are generally red and sometimes orange or even blue or purple in color, these pigments are being created. So while the rest of the leaf is busy dying and getting ready to die and fall off, there are active process of synthesis, biosynthesis going on in these leaves, so, and these pigments, these new red uh, anthocyanin pigments are being formed. So in species like sugar maple, uh, red maple especially, 
ash, that, that purple color, those are all the results of these anthocyanin pigments being formed. Some years it seems more vibrant or less vibrant. Is there a reason for that? When you think about it, there are so many different factors that impact the colors that we see. So it isn't necessarily just about how much anthocyanin is formed in a particular leaf, so how much red there is. Um, it, that interplays with how much chlorophyll has been lost already, or either there, you know, the red can be formed sort of on top of the green and make that changes the color that we see. And it also interplays with the conditions that we're seeing as a backdrop. So cloudy days actually often give, can give the most vibrant foliage um, because of just the contrast that we're seeing. You can have situations like this where this leaf has already undergone some tissue death here at the edge, at the leaf margin. So you can see this kind of brown um, showing up here. So the extent to which this has happened in a leaf can also impact the overall visual appearance that we see. So there's a lot going on. And, and then some of it is simply surely due to the contrasting conditions of what we see. So on a hillside where you have a lot of say white birch trees as part of the landscape or even a backdrop of green, dark green, evergreen trees, um, that can really influence what we're seeing. So in part, there's physiological things to do going on that have to do with the colors that we see and the clarity and the hues. Um, but then there is also just the other impacts of other factors that we see along with that. Um, so it's a really complex uh, question. And that's why really like the simplest answer is that you know, you're always going to have hits or misses. It, like, in many ways, there's not such a thing as a good year or a bad year for fall color. You're always going to have these sort of both magical pockets of good color and also times. Like there might be two days where color in one spot looks absolutely like the most spectacular thing you've ever seen, and then it's gone. Why do we have such great color here and in this region? There's a couple of factors that play into that. Um, one of first and foremost is the mix of species that we have. So um, say in areas where forests are very oak dominated, I mean, oaks have some nice color, of course, but um, they don't tend to have the same kind of uh, richness in reds and oranges that we have in some of our species that are really dominant in northern hardwood forests, like uh, sugar maples and red maples. And then the mix of species is also not just a part of what we see in terms of what leaves do. So we have a lot of leaves that make brilliant reds and purples. So we have maples and ashes making those. And then we have yellows of birches and, and beeches and things like that. Um, so that's leaf color, but we also have this great mixture of contrasting species that make a mix, a good contrast in the background. So our birches with their white bark and some of our evergreen species, some spruces and firs that are often in the background sort of on a landscape level, really provide a lot of contrast. And so what we see is really spectacular. And then we also, so it's not just the species we have, but we also have this predisposition to very, uh, weather that is known to promote the formation of anthocyanin synthesis. So cold temperatures can often boost anthocyanin production during fall senescence. Um, so we do have a lot of that. So it's interesting how the unique conditions in the fall that are unique to Vermont and are kind of predisposed us to have good fall coloration. We also have the other side of that in spring. We are have a unique set of weather conditions in the springtime that allow for Vermont to have really good conditions for sap to flow. So it's kind of interesting how we have the best of those two worlds here in the same state. Science aside, it's a magical time of the year. You see people pulling over their cars to take pictures and obviously a ton of people come into the state to be tourists at this time of the year. What do you think is so special about fall and fall foliage and the colors that we see? I really think that it's more of a, a full five senses experience. It's not just the visual cues that you're seeing, but it's also the smells that you're smelling, um, the like the 
temperatures that are out there, you know, those crisp, wonderful, sort of cool fall days, but that are bright and sunny. It's sort of a magical feast for our senses. And we do it, the climate here and the uh, environment here, the landscape here, really gives us the best of all of that. Um, add to that our landscape in general, our, you know, our mountains and our hillsides that we see, it gives us nice vantage points for looking and experiencing all of that. So, you know, I think that really plays into how it is such a magical time here. Our thanks to Abby for taking the time to help explain some of the science of fall foliage. From the science to the splendor, across the fences, cameras have been catching some of the fall colors. So we leave you today with the picture and sounds of autumn.